On behalf of the co-organizers of the INT program, Scientific Quantum Computing and Simulation on Near-Term Devices, David Dean, David Kaplan, Christine Mushik, and myself, I would like to welcome you to the first of three panel discussions, this one entitled The Coming Decade of Quantum Simulation. We've been able to bring together an absolutely stellar panel and moderator of leading figures and visionaries in the area of quantum information science. I would like to now introduce today's moderator, Ray Laflamme. Ray is the Canada Research Chair in Quantum Information Science in the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo and an associate member at the Perimeter Institute. Ray is a pioneer in the area of quantum information science, making many early and very significant contributions that have shaped the field, including the mathematical framework for error correction and many others. As an early visionary, Ray embraced the concept of what we now call co-design and co-development, having experimentalists and theorists work closely together, which is integral to the structure and operation of IQC, where he is founding director, and he completely appreciated its importance in developing a quantum-ready workforce. So without further ado, I hand over to Ray. Thank you. So thank you uh, to you and the co-organizers, uh, David Dean, David Kaplan, Kristen Muchik, and Martin Savage, who kind of uh, set up this program and uh, put this uh, panel uh, together. The development of quantum computers um, has hit some important milestones in the last few years from a subject which was uh, uh, seen as esoteric 20 years ago. It's now a mainstream area of physics, computer science, mathematics, chemistry, and more and more about engineering. We now know that quantum computers challenge today's uh, classical cryptography, that it might be useful for optimization problems. But when we look back at history, quantum simulation was the first application of quantum computers. That's the first places where we suddenly realized that quantum computers might have an advantage on classical computers. And this came in the early 1980s. Uh, Charlie Bennett has uh, asked uh, Richard Feynman if quantum mechanics would put a limit on the power of quantum computers. And what he had in mind was, um, was, was the uncertainty, uncertainty principle, which could be understood as implying kind of fundamentally some, we would lead to fundamental errors or uncertainty in the initial state of quantum computation. Would these errors propagate and limit the powers of quantum computers? The story goes that uh, Feynman thought about it for about five minutes and realized that no, uh, there wouldn't be no limit to uh, the uh, reliability of quantum computers due to the uncertainty principle. But what he kind of realized by thinking about this problem was that uh, quantum computers or quantum com uh, computing with quantum mechanics uh, using quantum computers might be more powerful than trying to do simulations on a classical computer. And this was kind of the first kind of uh, look towards using quantum devices to, do, uh, to, to try to simulate uh, quantum mechanical systems. Since it has been suggested that quantum simulation on quantum computers would help for areas like uh, condensed matter physics, chemistry, nuclear physics, particle physics, even quantum gravity. And to discuss this area, we have uh, with us uh, today a great panel of uh, a variety of people who have contributed to, to the field and uh, well, I'm going to look if uh, Matchek Lowenstein has arrived and I don't see his name. So why don't we start with uh, Misha Lukin. He's a professor of physics at Harvard. He has he contributed to many areas of quantum information science. And why, Misha, don't tell you about uh, what brought you to be interested in quantum simulation. And for right now, think about more about the past and we'll get to the future and future questions on the panel. So I'll leave you uh, la parole. All right, so I, I have a few slides, um, uh, which you know, I, I would like to share. So uh, I was actually expecting that, you know, uh, Maciek will kind of give a little bit of an overview of, you know, kind of the idea of using cold atom to, uh, for quantum simulations, in particular for simulations 
of lattice gauge theories that, that he pioneered. So, but you know, since he's not there, let me just give you kind of a little bit of an introduction to the types of quantum simulators we are building and you know where this is going in connection in particular with nuclear physics and problems and stuff like that. So the types of problems, you know, quantum simulators which we are assembling um, involve essentially engineering quantum systems atom by atom. So specifically what we do um, is we trap atoms in the so-called optical tweezers and we typically trap not just one atom, but many. And, you know, when you try to do it, you know, from the kind of low density gas of uh, pre-cooled atoms, you typically would grab some atoms, you'd capture some atoms, but you'd have a lot of entropy in the system. So the way how we remove the entropy is by just removing some traps and kind of rearranging the um, other traps in a way, you know, to assemble, to place the atoms where we want and then in addition, we can engineer the interactions between the atoms by exciting them in the so-called Rydberg states, in the states where the, the atom have large size and they really feel each other's presence. Present. So basically, this is the approach which we have been pursuing for you know, now a few years in collaboration with my colleagues, Markus Greiner and Vlad and Vulitich at uh, Harvard MIT Center for Ultra Cold Atoms. So the specific approach we use to engineer interactions is by exciting atoms in the Rydberg state where the size of the atom, you know, of electron cloud increases literally by, you know, several orders of magnitude. And as a result, the interactions increase also by many orders of magnitude. So, you know, by 14 orders of magnitude, for example, if we put the atoms in a state in F equals 100. And we can make use of these strong interactions, so in particular, uh, in these uh, simulators we built, we use this effect called Rydberg blockade, which basically blocks the excitations of more than one atom at once, once atoms are close together. And it turns out that this is actually a very effective mechanism to entangle atoms, to create correlations, to simulate complex interactions. So this is kind of, you know, the steps in this quantum simulator uh, procedure, which, you know, we're utilizing. And you know there are a couple of groups around the world which pursue this kind of approach. So using this approach, we can, um, for example, you know, do quantum computation in a conventional way by executing sequences of gates. You know, we can also directly build the models of interest and study interesting quantum phase transitions. We can study non-equilibrium dynamics, and in fact, we already made some discoveries in this. You know, and we, or we can create large entangled states. So this is a kind of you know, uh, the toolbox and the opportunities which we can uh, uh, kind of pursue. So uh, in a recent, our recent year or so, we have actually extended our, you know, system to control now two-dimensional arrays of the atoms and we can place them in any ways we kind of want and, you know, create one in a kind of uh, irregular patterns on demand. And basically this is actually a very interesting starting point for um, uh, problems uh, of interest uh, for nuclear physics community. So I think, let me just, you know, cut, uh, directly skip maybe to the last slide. So in particular, uh, by using these tools and techniques, what we can do is we can directly implement uh, some, you know, complex arrangements and excitations of atoms to implement, you know, ideas like lattice gauge theories. So in fact, you know, uh, one can study either engineered systems, you know, or even kind of naturally emerging lattice gauge theories. And uh, this is actually an exciting direction, which, you know, we are starting to, you know, pursue in these systems with frustration, with frustrated lattices. And there are kind of very interesting, you know, possibilities and very interesting questions which one could ask. For example, how do you detect, characterize, probe uh, these states and or how you can apply them. So, for example, this uh, lattice gauge theories are very closely related to things like spin liquids, which themselves are related to things like topological error correction. And, you know, I'd say that using the tools and techniques we developed, we are now entering in a regime where explorations of these things is, you know, very much possible. Thank you very much, uh, Misha. And I do apologize to Maciek, who was there apparently 
when I, I pass over his name. So here he will uh, take the, the microphone. Maciek uh, Lewenstein is professor of physics at the Institute of Photonic Science in Barcelona, Spain. And there you are, wherever you are. <laughs> I am, I am, I am. <laughs> Okay, uh, I can you I can share the screen. How is it? Yes. Yeah. But it has not appeared yet. Martin, can you be? Uh, sorry. So yeah, yeah, I'm I'm fighting with the screen. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. There you go. Uh, You see it? There. Yes, there it is. I also have too many slides, so I will stop at some moment. But anyway, I have to show you. I have to start with showing the money sources. Because <laughs> the many money sources, the big group, which works on many aspects of quantum simulators. Uh, so the platforms that we probably will focus today, superconducting Q with John is here, ultra cold atoms, I will talk a little about Tris and Rydberg already mentioned by Misha, but there are more, circuit QD, photonic systems, and things like that. Task and goals uh, in quantum simulation is, of course, in the first place would be classical quantum optimization problems for technology, which is starting, and Misha has done works on that, and John and others, but it's at the very beginning. Quantum chemistry mentioned by Rai, it's an array, but it is another area which is developing very rapidly, but we are at the very beginning. But fundamental problems of physics with these quantum simulators, this is really something that started 10 years ago, and there are many results which go be beyond the classical computers, really with some kind of quantum system. And the typical problems that we want to solve are paradigmatic, notoriously difficult development system for uh, physics, model systems, Fundamental system of condensed matter, high energy, novel quantum simulators, and novel systems, novel physics. This is what I will be talking about. I will mention a little about diagnosis and design, depending on the time. So let me start. Paradigmatic, notoriously difficult. Of course, the example is um, beautiful works by Marcus Greiners and others also on Hubbard models, so the classical Fermi Hubbard model. And there was a lot of progress in the recent years using this famous atomic microscope that allow you to observe uh, atoms in the lattices with single atom and single site resolution and to manipulate them, to dope them in a controlled way and things like that. The fundamental systems of condensed matter, uh, another example uh, is from uh, Peter uh, Zoller and Reiner Blatt's uh, group, so this time these are trapped ions. Here they verify, here they verify co variational quantum simulation using uh, 20 qubits of uh, ions and studying the Schwinger, uh, Schwinger model, which is uh, one of the paradigmatic models of high energy physics. Um, okay, the way it works is that they have a hybrid calculation use quantum system to calculate energies and classical computer to do the variation of calculation. We have written recently a paper on bosonic finger model, which maybe it's easier to simulate with ultra cold atoms, where also you can study such a things like lack of thermalization due to confinement of mesons or of uh, particle pairs. Novel quantum simulators, this is the title of my ERC grant, which has started a year ago, where I want to actually do the simulators of attosecond physics, ultra fast physics with strong laser fields using ultra cold atoms or vice versa. Example of the things that happened there, this is a paper which will be published in ERV this week. Probably uh, you can herald topological phase and phase transition by studying very highly nonlinear response to circularly polarized uh, strong laser acting on uh, topological insulators like. Uh, model or any two-dimensional so. model. So you put the circularly polarized lasers on them, strong laser fields. The answer is high harmonic generation, very strongly nonlinear, yet you can read something about topology. 
Cobalt system number field is completely artificial ones that we don't know from condensed matter and other areas of physics. This example this week in Physical Review X, we published a, a paper in which the, um, about the, something which is known as Kreuzleder, so it's known in high energy physics as a mo paradigmatic model, but here the mechanism of uh, generating deconfinement due to the uh, appearance of quantum solitons and uh, uh, Harold bomb maps is completely new. So there are systems that can st study it with ultra cold atoms and and ions and can uh, bring physics that is not known from uh, Okay, the single side particle resolution I was talking about uh, the microscope. This is the ionic microscope done by Stefan Kur. Uh, the okay, this work says you know this is beautiful atoms with single atom. Uh, resolution. The, uh, another thing which is important that is developed, Misha mentioned, entanglement and topology characterization can be done in a completely new ways now. Random unitaris toolbox introduced by uh, Peter Zoller group and his collaborators was used in experiments with Rainer Brab to measure Rene entropy uh, to uh, determine statistical, uh, to determine statistical Chain number for many body system interacting. This was with Mohammed Hafezi um, and and more and more and more. The last paper that I just put on the on the on the um, archives is about Hamilton, uh, entanglement Hamiltonian topography. So they really get the whole entanglement spectrum and more. I think Matt Check will uh, we'll come back to some of these issues yes, I, during the panel. So can you wrap yes, up? I, the, I, I'm finished. I understand I have to finish. Topological characterization, sorry. Uh, so topological characterization with experiment friendly approaches. It's also something that has developed in the synthetic dimensions, uh, which is an, another area which is very nice for exploring new ways of quantum simulation. So you want me to stop? Yeah, thank you very much, Magic. Uh, we'll now move to uh, John. John Martinez is professor of physics at UC Santa Barbara. And he is uh, joining us from Sydney. I was going to say from sunny Sydney, but at this time of night, it's probably in the middle of the night over there. So, <laughs> and, and we can see how dark it is in this background. So John, you have the mic. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm John Martinez. I've been working on superconducting qubits basically since the 1980s and had a kind of a unique professional career, if you like, uh, starting from building the first qubits to all the way up to building uh, complex systems and, and uh, the first quantum computers. Uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, getting the qubits to work and about 10 years ago, I started thinking about building systems and simulator systems and uh, moved to Google and was able to make a 2D array of qubits, uh, of kind of looking for uh, doing error correction and then, of course, last year we got the quantum uh, supremacy experiment published, uh, which uh, had uh, enough qubits and enough coherence that you could do a simple kind of random, pseudo random uh, problem to show that the quantum computer could do a calculation much faster than a classical computer. And I would say what was nice about that is. Uh, I think it convinced uh, the engineers and maybe Silicon Valley executives that there was really something to this quantum uh, computing that it could actually do, in, do something powerful. And of course, the next step is to do something useful and quantum simulation is, is certainly, uh, certainly towards that, that way. Uh, it of course uh, provided the basis for doing error correction via the surface code. It was forward compatible with that. And I also liked it because it, um, it showed that when you scaled up these systems and, and made very complex systems, that the physics was still all working properly. There were no new things. Now for physicists, of course we say, yeah, okay, it's gonna work, work right. Uh, but I think for uh, practical people, engineers, you know, they really like to see that. But I would say what was in particularly interesting is that by really well engineering your system, you can predict the fidelity, the performance of many qubits, many gates from single and two qubit gates. It was compatible with that using, in fact, a probabilistic model. So that was very important. 
Um, moving forward, I just wanted to share uh, one screen. Uh, 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 okay, share. Okay, and I wanted to share uh, moving forward, the Google Theory team has been using this processor to do quantum simulations. And there's a, a series of experiments here. Uh, uh, some of them has been uh, published. Some are, are going through review or being written right now. But the point I want to make is we're now at the stage with these processors that we're doing thousands of total gates and getting good results by carefully calibrating the system, designing it, of course, and also using some error mi mitigation techniques. So at a thousand gates, you're really uh, starting to do, uh, you know, significant computations and doing some of the biggest uh, computations that ever been done. And, and, and amazingly, when you look at these results, um, you get sensible results. It makes sense. Quantum simulations work. And I, I think this kind of gate counts for algorithms is really a nice way to show uh, uh, things are going well and you can do simulations. So uh, Google plans to open this up as a cloud service soon. And uh, I think people will be excited that they can run their whatever quantum simulations you want on this machine uh, that they're working very well, kind of in a practical sense. And of course, is, is kind of fully programmable. And then uh, in long term, of course, you want to do error correction. The team's working on that and have some new results on that. And uh, things are looking looking well. Of course, we have to keep continue, continuing our, our qubits, uh, which, which is happening. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, John. And now, uh, Chris Moreau, professor of EEC and physics. So all the other professors that we've had were all physics. And now we have a e ENC at Duke University, but he's also a professor of physics and EEC, the reverse order, at the University of Maryland. So Chris, tell us about ion drafts. OK, thanks, Ray. I, I, I guess I'll follow, uh, follow the pattern, share a few slides, just have a couple. I know we don't have, don't have too much time. Um, so uh, indeed, I'm, I'm actually in a superposition between Maryland and Duke, as so the joke goes. Um, but but uh, I will talk very briefly at a very high level on, on uh, how uh, I think the next decade or even plus will go in this field. And you know, it's interesting that I, I, I think the science argument for quantum computing is really compelling, but maybe not exactly the way you think. Um, there's sort of two levels of science in, uh, in building able quantum computers. One of them is the science of the qubit itself. And I think in the many different platforms that, that are represented even by this panel, um, there's different levels of science there. I think the, uh, the natural quantum systems like these individual atoms or photons, there's, there's, you could argue that there, there's uh, much more engineering involved here because this, there's, we're not gonna learn anything more about these atomic qubits. Um, uh, they're, they're absolutely perfectly replicable. They have no idle errors. So there are no, T1 and T2 are essentially infinite. Th that doesn't mean that you can do infinitely long computations. Obviously, the, the control of these, uh, of these atoms is what's necessary. And maybe that hints why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm partly an engineer, although uh, uh, I think John and I could easily flip back and forth between physics and engineering. But also, I, I, I will talk a little bit about what I think is very important uh, on the industrial side of building these systems. And of course, with Jung Sang Kim, we founded a, a, a startup called INQ that builds ion trap quantum computers. Um, so <laughs> at, at a very high level, I, I, uh, I, I, I like to show this slide these days because I think um, universities and industry are somewhat complementary uh, in interesting ways. Uh, you know, at the university, we're comfortable with all these radical laws of computing. And we can do blue skies research, whereas at industry, you know, I think you you really have to make an ec economic case for computing, and you know they're not going to be patient for a decade of uh, just research. But also, you know, the workforce in industry, the engineers that we desperately need, may not be so familiar with what entanglement means and so forth. Though, though that that's not such a big deal because I think industry offers something universities re really never can offer, and that is the ability to build things to build a device that a third party can use, somebody who knows something about lattice gauge theory and doesn't care what the qubits are made of, but wants to run an algorithm. 
Um, that's what industry is very good at, uh, ha having, having a, a sound systems engineering approach. And I think with the US National Quantum Initiative, many around the world as well, having national laboratories uh, do, do everything is I think a, a very good recipe. I think right now the DOE laboratories, the defense laboratories are getting up to speed. I think that's a really good thing. They can, in a sense, do it all because they do build things and they're not uncomfortable with research, that's for sure. So um, back to the ion traps, this is sort of a horror picture of an, uh, an atomic physics lab. Um, of course, every optic on the table is adjustable and all the electronics has been put together by grad students and so forth. Um, but but um, over the last many years, I'm happy to say that we've really engineered the hell out of that system. Um, this is a university system that's funded by IARPA and the NSF. Um, and without much exaggeration, everything you see here outside of the students were sho shoved into this, this meter cube box that's fully autonomous. We'd never open the box, well, every six months or so. Um, and it has a template of 32 qubits, fully programmable, uh, uh, arbitrary connection, uh, random access, everything. So it's kind of a neat system. And uh, w what it's afforded us the ability to do this is working with places like Sandia that builds silicon chips, nothing quantum about that, that just hosts a bunch of electrodes that we can support these atoms on. And of course, uh, there's a lot of optical engineering. It's all classical. Every, all of the challenges are classical. Um, and I, I think folding I and Q in this, our, our system, uh, the system operates at room temperature. And as we scale up, the system's getting smaller, but we're packing more qubits in there. Uh, eventually, we're going to have photonic interconnects between modules and have sort of a multi-core version of a quantum computer. And I think that's really the only way to think about scaling in this modular, modular fashion. Um, and error correction is something we don't really think about now. We don't have to because the native errors are so low. And we'll never, I don't think we need fault tolerance, full fault tolerance. That's, I, I think that's even a fiction. I think you just need enough error correction to be able to get to the job you want to do. And so the, all this talk of, we can talk later about NISC era. I think we'll always be in NISC era. We're always going to have noise no matter what. I don't think we'll, I think fault, fully fault tolerant error correction is sort of like string theory. Um, so over the last many years, we've, we've had the happy circumstance of enjoying a different type of science. And that is our system on campus has been sort of a user facility. And we've collaborated with all kinds of folks across the world, from industry, government, um, other universities that want to run circuits to do anything. Um, and it, it, this is the most fun uh, time I've had in my career because I'm learning about cosmology, scrambling in black holes. I'm learning about condensed matter, models of magnetism and phase transitions. And with my colleagues um, at Maryland, Norbert Link is a professor. Marco Satina and Crystal Noel are actually moving with me to Duke next year, where we're gonna build more and more systems. And this is the high level science that quantum simulation really is about. That this high level science of doing something that doesn't depend on what the bottom qubit technology is. And this I think is super exciting and it's gonna to have to pay the bills in this field for the next many years because it's hard to argue that there's going to be, you know, an economic um, uh, 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 killer app in the next few years. I think industry needs to be fed uh, uh, something interesting. And I think it's gonna come from science, in particular things like the areas of nuclear physics that uh, a lot of the folks uh, like Martin and David Dean and others are, are thinking about. So that's all I have, thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, the next uh, panel member is Sarah Ansosov. She is a program manager at the Advanced Scientific Computing Research at DOE. And maybe you can say a few words about one of the slides from Chris, where you mentioned that the National Lab had little history in the field. So tell us about, about the history of quantum simulation at DOE. Uh, I, I sure will. And I do have, I found a couple of slides that I can show you guys. So, um, but uh, let me let me speak a little bit about the uh, QIS in DOE and and it's a little bit tangled with a little bit of a personal journey for me. Um, as um, Chris mentioned, uh, there's not DOE is somewhat of a newcomer to the field. Um, back in 2012 2013, I was a relatively junior uh, program manager in advanced scientific computing research. And uh, for those who are not very familiar with the program, uh, we're one of the uh, six core program offices within the Office of Science. And our mission is to uh, support research and um, the development and deployment of tools and 
uh, computing systems in high performance computing. Um, but we had no investments in QIS, no direct investments, I should say, uh, because a lot of the uh, programs that we supported in the past really are essential in, in terms of establishing the groundwork that is very important for QIS. So uh, my background is actually in chemistry. I was in the advanced scientific computing research and, and uh, I certainly had an interest in, in uh, quantum computing and quantum simulations. So I started getting interested in it and, and talking to more people in other offices. Um, and again, Chris mentioned the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the, uh, of the field. And I was actually managing a program in high performance computing where I was talking to uh, physicists a lot. So they really uh, uh, encouraged me to take a look at this field. Uh, and luckily nobody stopped me in, in, in with an office of science. And then the political climate was, was um, appropriate as well that we got a lot of uh, bipartisan support uh, in, in uh, computing in general, but, but also in quantum information sciences. So uh, in 2015, uh, we uh, organized the first quantum computing workshop within DOE. And then from there, it really took off. So I'm gonna show you a couple of slides. Um, bear with me, I'm gonna share my screen on what it means for us. So um, really for QIS, for us, QIS crosses the technical breadth of the whole Office of Science. So the approach that we're taking is really to include all of the uh, Office of Science programs, uh, but also to cover a wide scope uh, within QIS. Uh, quantum simulation is one of them, uh, but certainly we're, we're also interested in quantum communication and quantum sensing, uh, and we already have established programs. Um, again, uh, all six core program offices uh, are investing in programs that are important uh, and specific to their missions, but also in, in, in programs uh, such as the uh, QIS, um, National QIS Research Centers, uh, we are actually looking to advance uh, cross cutting areas uh, in fundamental science, quantum computing, quantum communication, and quantum sensing. So uh, again, just to show you the, um, the journey here, is that uh, prior to 2015, uh, the only investments that we had in quantum information science was through pilot projects or uh, uh, somewhat side projects in, in other programs. Uh, and we started our real programs in 2017 um, with uh, investments in algorithms and quantum computing hardware and some pilot projects. Now, um, you know, fast forward to um, fiscal year 2021, our request is approaching to um, almost uh, 250 million per year um, in overall in, in quantum information sciences. Um, again, uh, we did not have a lot of history in our national labs, uh, but our national labs had a lot of uh, uh, investments in fundamental science and applications and engineering that, that really, uh, that they really formed the uh, fundamentals for quantum information science to make leaps. So uh, the last slide that I'm gonna show is the, uh, you probably know the uh, recent announcement of the uh, five national quantum information research science, the research centers uh, that um, I am leading overall uh, for the uh, Office of Science. Uh, we're very excited about these centers. And uh, not only we think that they're gonna make big advances in science, uh, but also in terms of, you know, uh, uh, transferring technology to industry as appropriate. Uh, QIS ecosystem stewardship. Uh, are there things that they can do in terms of uh, workforce development um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, collaborating with external entities? So, uh, again, they're just being stood up. Uh, they just started. So uh, the, uh, all of the information about the uh, Office of Science Investments and QIS can be found on this website. Uh, the centers are not our only uh, investments in this field. Uh, again, the way that we see is that uh, we parse the, 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 our strategy into two. How can we advance the um, quantum information sciences. This could be quantum simulation or quantum communication or sensing. 
uh, what are the things that we can bring that are unique uh, to the field? And uh, what are the main application areas of these um, uh, thrusts that are really critical to DOE's mission? At the end of the day, we are an admission agency. Uh, so in a lot of the programs that you see, a lot of the solicitations, you're gonna get that sense that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, find proposals that can answer these two questions. Really, uh, what is unique to DOE that's gonna make a uh, difference in QIS? And, uh, and how is this important to our mission? And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Siren. Now that we have had a, a self-introduction from all the panelists, let's go and dive into uh, the area. And I'm going to start with a question. And any of the panelists who have some ideas how to answer uh, the, the comments, uh, jump in. So my first question is, uh, since Feynman, kind of, which is already uh, 30, 40 years ago, what are the main milestones that you believe have been uh, achieved in the field of quantum simulation, especially in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. And you, you cannot say only milestone related to your own research, but kind of what do you think in the field of quantum simulation? What are the main uh, milestone? So maybe I, if the panelists are very quiet, I'll then point to uh, Metric and ask him uh, okay. what does he think as a theorist has been the main. So I think that uh, evidently, uh, let me maybe concentrate on one track called atoms because the other platforms are represented by the others. So this is maybe natural that I will talk about it. So the breakthrough was, of course, of the solar Sirac proposal to do the bose hubbard model in the, uh, in the optical uh, lattices. And even this model, even though it is, uh, can be simulated by uh, Monte Carlo, uh, quantum Monte Carlo methods, even this model, if you go to big systems and very cold systems, the simulations are very, very difficult. And obviously it was very early also understood that, that simulation of dynamics of this kind of systems, even in 1D, are absolutely very difficult to, um, to simulate. So, so this was a breakthrough, I would say. Of course, the, as I said, paradigmatic goal was the Fermi Hubbard model, which is done now, as we heard also by superconducting qubits, but for me, the, uh, so to say, the leading experiments are the, the Harvard MIT experiments where they are able to dope the Hubbard model to observe single particle uh, hole uh, traveling in the strongly correlated um, environment and so on. Another thing which is extremely, uh, in my opinion, uh, important, are all these things related to artificial gauge fields and in particular artificial gauge fields uh, generated by a, a modulated time dependent Floquet techniques and things like that. This is really an enormous progress in the last years and also I think you see. This is related of course also to the simulators of uh, lattice, dynamical lattice gauge theories that uh, Misha was uh, mentioning. There was also a extreme progress recently. Maybe not breakthroughs, but in the artificial gauge fields external, definitely breakthroughs because people can control these things very, very well. Another phenomenon that has been uh, realized is the many body localization and let's say disordered systems. The single atom Anderson localization that was already beautiful experiment, although not quantum simulator in the sense of uh, hard to compute systems, but many body localization, it's very challenging. I, check to, I, want, I want to spice things up a little bit. I'm going to push back a little bit on some of those early uh, demonstrations. There is very little tunability in those systems, almost none. And uh, so, you know, there, I, I guess there's a continuum of tunability. On the one hand, you have fully universal quantum computer. On the other hand, you have a system that simulates itself and nothing else. Um, so, yeah, you know, but uh, I mean, the quantum simulator is not support, it's not a, a universal quantum computer. A quantum simulator, by definition, is a <clears throat> quantum computer of special purpose, which is supposed to simulate a uh, given <clears throat> theoretical model of uh, physics. Now, the, uh, of course, it should have some flexibility, otherwise you will not be able to validate it, probably. 
it would be very nice if you can bring it to the regimes in which you can compare it with some numerical calculations and then enter into terra incognita when the calculations are uh, no, I, I, agree, I agree. I agree there. But what about, say, the ground state of the cesium atom? It's 9.2 gigahertz plus about 14 more digits. You can't calculate that. But the cesium atom simulates it really well. <laughs> yes, uh, this is a, a fair point, but I don't want to calculate precise value of the energy of cesium atom with quantum simulators that are devoted to study uh, strongly interacting, strongly correlated many body systems. I mean, I know cesium is few body strongly correlated system, but still, I mean, the different thing is here, I think, that, as the goal. So, um, I mean, you, it's like with this, uh, I mean, you cannot demand from this kind of system to do these things. I mean, you should focus on the problems that are interesting and challenging, and that can be done. I think I, I uh, want to raise the have question. A little bit different take on this. I'll just I'll be quick. Um, you know, uh, in the beginning, you have to use your quantum computers on very simple problems because you don't have a lot of coherence, not very many qubits, and that's been done. Now, the quantum computers have been getting better, and you have more qubits and more number of gates. And I think the important part right now is to make sure that the quantum computers are getting the right answer. What you're programming is what you're looking at. And it's a really interesting age where, you know, you can see that it can, how, how to solve problems and it can solve problems. And then, of course, in the future, we're going to get to the stage where a quantum computer can start solving problems that you can't solve on a classical computer. And it's powerful and both useful. And we're just kind of going through those different stages right now. And I think we all look forward to the next 10 years because we think we can start doing more and more of the latter. And uh, you know, then of course the, the field will be quite interesting. And it I think it's true, but we are talking about quantum yeah. simulators, which are not quantum computers, as quantum computers of special purpose that they have, they already have quantum advantage since 10 years. Uh, super, super uh, that, that really, um, I think people have analyzed this and that quantum advantage people tout is not necessarily correct and that you could calculate things using mean field theories and other things. Uh, so one should be very not for the dynamics of quantum, quantum system. Advantage, not, for, not, for the dynamics of the quantum systems. This is normally impossible. That's why I gave actually the example of quantum many body. Uh, localization, which is particularly hard to see. So maybe I can, maybe I can a little bit to kind of, you know, which will bridge a little bit, you know, this discussion. So I think there is something which happened over the last maybe three or four years, in my view, which is very special, and that we kind of, with some of the quantum simulator platforms, we are kind of entering the the age of like, you know, scientific discovery. And there are already a few examples, in particular in this area of dynamics, where, you know, by doing quantum simula simulations, we discovered phenomena which have not been theoretically predicted. You know, exactly. You can then go back and, you know, make some approximations, maybe, you know, construct a tensor network state which would simulate it. But to begin with, you know, the system scales and size of the group force, you would not be able to do it, you know? And I think there are already a few examples of that. And I think it's very, very special because yeah, yeah. That, you know, I think that's the first payoff of yeah. this. Yes, I agree. So many of you have mentioned about uh, results and uh, verification. So what are your opinions of how do we ensure that you discover something which is really something which is there and not something that comes in because the gates are imperfect and kind of come out to results that were not predicted. So to me, you know, if I were to continue, and I mean, this verification in general is very one big challenge that the, the field is facing. But to me, this age of discovery, the beauty of that, is that oftentimes once you have a discovery, you could go back and try to, you know, put together maybe like simple models, you know, or, you know, some, you know, some kind of 
you know, truncated numerics, you know, like tensor networks, matrix product state, which somehow gets at least some, you know, sort of independent kind of verification of that, you know? So in a way, this discovery, you know, age of discovery is very special because I think it will allow us to go back and forth. And of course, you know, we'll push for things which we will not be able to, you know, verify, but, you know, I think we are kind of getting there, so. So you're thinking about your quantum computer as your laboratory where people are trying something and suddenly they find a new phenomena. And then by analyzing this, they can find a simpler model that explain it, but you would not have find, thought about that simpler model before yes, you saw the result in the experiment. Think about, for example, when people started studying, you know, chaos on classical computers, right? Where they were running things and trying to understand, you know? Think about what's happening with, uh, with neural nets. I mean, people still don't understand, you know, how they work, you know, and, and when they work. And yet, you know, there is already people make use of them and make discoveries, you know. I, I, I hope that this quantum era is kind of entering into this stage, you know. I would second Peter Zoller. He, he had the quantum science seminar about quantum simulations last week uh, in the Google. And uh, one of the most important thing that he said, what is concerning exactly the verification is the possibility of checking that you have entanglement and what kind of entanglement, or maybe even non-locality in your quantum many body uh, systems. And for this, uh, and there is an enormous progress of these experimental methods of determin determining the entanglement. In, in particular, I mentioned this, uh, uh, random unitary toolbox that the Innsbruck group, group has developed, but there are more things. There are, uh, we have, for instance, developed a method of uh, measuring both entanglement and uh, um, non-locality in quantum many body states using uh, only second order correlators, so things that are experimentally friendly and so on. But these are very important, uh, in my opinion, diagnostic method which will help you to be sure exactly that what you are, uh, so to say, producing in your experiment, that you can verify that it really has a quantum properties, which are not uh, easy to, to find other ones in many body systems. As well. um, a few of you have mentioned the idea of right now is a turning point where in the last 10 years, we'll say people were doing problems where they pretty much knew the answer, but they, you needed to do them on these quantum devices to learn how they work and what are the challenges. And right now we're just at the turning point where we start to do things that we had not predicted what the answer would be. So uh, my, my question related to this is, what are the challenges that are present in the various technologies which are uh, there that we have to overcome in order to go to the next step of having quantum computers which can do things that there's no way classical computers could do. One of the things I would like to um, talk about is, so it's a little bit unusual here, is the need to have um, well calibrated systems um, for example, there's a recent paper, the last six months or nine months, our group re reviewed, where if, for example, you try to simulate a problem 2D with matrix product states, and you look at the real solution, the matrix product states kind of put in roughly a 2% error uh, per gate operation through the approximation of the matrix product states. And of course, the matrix product states are uh, kind of classically simulable, simulable. So if you want to see new quantum phenomenon, it seems natural to hypothesize that you need to have, you know, accurate, well-calibrated gates to know what you're simulating. So uh, this goes with the calibration issue that we talked about last question. And I would say people have to continue to work, not just to have good coherence, but actually to know what the Hamiltonian is you're applying. And as you build a big system, you have to know that everything's staying as you would expect it to be. And then you, you can you accurately know what you're doing. 
So on that uh, line, Chris, you have a system with which you claim had no uh, noise, no T1 or T2. And so what is the challenge that you have in the ION uh, system? A and is there a breakthrough which is needed or is just kind of hard word engineering to get more control on these ions? Well, I, I come from an atomic clock background and you know, a good, a good atomic qubit is a very good atomic clock. The best atomic clocks are good to a part in 10 to the 18, but you don't need anywhere near that. Uh, sort of off the get go, we get a part in 10 to the 12 or so. Um, and again, that's way better than you need. And all I'm saying is that there are no idle errors. That's fine. You don't, I mean, why would you expect an idle error? An atom is isolated in free space, has a collision with the background gas every few hours. <laughs> um, it's, it doesn't interact with anything. And it has the, the well, states well, I'm are- I'm gonna s stop you there. <laughs> um, I remember many years ago uh, when I, my colleague Magnique, Neil and I were kind of visiting you in, in Boulder, there was this heating of these ions. Mm -hmm. So this, you might say, um, uh, th this has got solved, but that was a problem that there was. No, uh, if my, my prediction even back then was that we would get rid of it before we solve it. But that heating doesn't affect the qubit. When the qubit is left idle, it can move around. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the coherence one bit. If you look at the cesium atomic clock from 20 years ago, each cesium atom went four meters in a coherent superposition and didn't lose any coherence. That's, that's just Chris, what you get in atomic physics. Now, Chris, what you're the, talking about with the heating, of course, plays a role when you want to get them entangled, of course. Operations are not perfect. That's, and that's 100% of our challenges. It's the external control. And I would say the heating comes from thermally activated fields from the nearby electrodes. It's a classical control thing. When you cool to four Kelvin, it goes away. In that sense, you know, we don't need to understand it. Well, we would love to understand it, but it seems to be, you know, uh, maybe it's even related to what's seen in most solid state uh, qubit platforms. Of course, in a solid state, you're angstroms away from these things. We're, you know, a tenth of a millimeter away where it, it's very small and it can be quenched. So it's not going to limit us when we get, uh, uh, the thing that will limit us is the fields that, um, the, the fields that drive gates can have a very small probability of scattering and basically measuring. And that can be in the 10, 10 to 50 parts per million rate range. And you know, we're not there yet. When we get there yet, that's when we have to deploy a few rounds of very efficient error correction because the native errors are so low. So, you know, I said it before, the challenges, they're not atomic physics, uh, unless you picked a, a horrible atom or you, you know, you did something silly. Um, the, the challenges are entirely engineering. Of course, there are also challenges on the theoretical side, so the connecting to verification. So we have to develop better methods of many body, of treating many body systems, and this mentioned many times. Absolutely. Tensor networks is one of these methods. The exact diagonalization has developed extremely in the last years because there were new needs exactly uh, related to the mentioned problem of many body localization. Uh, there are uh, methods that are very commonly used in quantum information to characterize uh, states, which are the semi-definite uh, programming, and they're becoming very, very useful also in treating many body systems, trying to find, for instance, instead of uh, upper bounds to the energy, like uh, variation in variational principle, the lower bounds, which also give you a lot of information and finally, machine learning, which is really booming and which is really starting to be applied to quantum systems, combined even with quantum processors. And, uh, uh, and there is a lot of things to be done there, uh, including uh, in not only application of uh, uh, classical uh, machine learning methods to numerical or experimental data, but also uh, I think that uh, understanding of this machine learning, which usually is uh, considered to be that we don't know what these machines do. There is a lot of progress in recent years to understand which neurons, which role play and so on. And I think we will get a lot of information of this sort by analyzing quantum systems with machine learning. Thank you, Maciek. Um, next question I wanted to ask you, 
is, and it relates to one of the comments that uh, Misha has done, has made, saying that um, there is, we are at the, the, the beginning of the era of discovering new things with quantum computers. Now, if we are a physicist, I see the, uh, the, the, the real interest of physicists or maybe a chemist to go and do this. But for somebody who is not a quantum information scientist, somebody who would be, I don't know, in the biomedical field or the drug de delivery and sometimes quantum computers were, have been claimed to be potentially useful for drug de delivery. For somebody who's not a quantum computer scientist, is there anything at present which is interesting for them or it will be in the next 10 years where they will see impact of quantum simulation for their field? Should I start or? Go, go Misha. <laughs> I, you know, I think it is important. You know, I, I do agree that the first applications will be related to applications in the sense of this quantum simulators and the kind of discovery, age, in the age of discovery will be in the area of quantum physics or maybe quantum chemistry. But I do think that, you know, as the systems, you know, become, you know, larger, more coherent and more programmable, even if they are not completely universal machines, you can already start, you know, thinking about, for example, implementing, you know, various kinds of, you know, quantum algorithms, algorithms for problems like optimization or maybe sampling, you know, and, um, and, you know, a lot of, I mean, I think right now we have only very few, you know, algorithms with proven like significant speed up. And I think, you know, you know, what's special about this age of discovery is that, you know, through clever sort of implementation through this kind of, through this core design, we can start already trying to run some of this kind of much less trivial, you know, potentially, you know, much more practical kind of algorithms and really just, you know, try to benchmark them against the best possible, you know, classical algorithms, you know. So, and I think this is a huge opportunity, right? You know, maybe if not right away, outright kind of outperforming them, at least, you know, understanding their scaling, you know, and um, I think there is, a lot of you know challenges you know we need to find those algorithms we have to figure out how to implement them very efficiently through this core design you know and you know we also need to understand what the applic applications are but i think this is something that you know which is very special about this point in time and i hope that you know a few systems can really you know push uh you know this frontier which yeah, means Yes. I was going to ask you, Saren, of what, what do you think, um, and what was the philosophy and the thinking of DOE of investing now in the knowledge that probably tomorrow it, it won't be useful to DOE by tomorrow morning or by, by early next year? So what is the, the, the expectation that DOE has? What is the philosophy has behind these five uh, centers that they have uh, started? Well, so first of all, you know, I'm in the Office of Science, so we, we support basic research. And so we don't actually put a time scale to basic research, just like we don't put a time scale on, you know, investments that we make to understand black hole. We don't claim that, you know, we're going to solve the mysteries of uh, black hole in, in, in five years or anything like that. So for us, uh, QIS with an Office of Science is a long-term commitment and a long-term investment, and we're really interested in you know, learning more about, um, uh, not only about QIS, but also about other fields as we keep investing and forming teams, interdisciplinary teams uh, that can work, uh, of people who can work with uh, QIS experts. So um, the, uh, I guess going back to the question is that I think as more uh, communities start looking into uh, quantum information science, we're gonna learn more I mean, certainly there are some, uh, you know, obvious applications like in quantum chemistry and, and, and nuclear physics and, and things like that. But even within physics, you know, there's a variety. Uh, for example, the uh, plasma physicists started looking at the quantum computing and, and, and 
uh, trying to understand what it means for them. Uh, so if you look at some of the investments that we're making out of the uh, fission energy sciences for QIS, uh, they're trying to understand if they can come up with algorithms that is useful for plasma physics, but also if whether or not they can actually refine some uh, classical algorithms that could be uh, used for, for quantum simulation. So I think for us, this whole um, interaction between different communities who weren't necessarily interacting before is going to be very, very uh, impactful. Um, and, you know, DOE's other uh, communities uh, start looking into this too. Um, there's the um, uh, IEEE Quantum Week going on now, and there's a workshop, for example, on renewal of energy. So are there engineering uh, applications of quantum computing? I think there are. Uh, and, and, and they're starting to look at this. I mean, certainly the chemistry simulations are important for renewable energy, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, scheduling and distribution and um, uh, the impact of uh, some of the uh, uh, quantum computing applications on these, um, uh, who knows what they're gonna find as they start looking into this. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the possibilities are, but I think overall, that is really our goal uh, and uh, with an office of science especially we don't necessarily expect that we're going to achieve this 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 you know within certain time frames uh, we invest in basic research and uh, qis it has a lot of potential uh, for us not only in terms of the um, contributions that we can make in the field but also in terms of what it can teach us and other communities thank you very much Hi. I would like to maybe add a comment uh, and an optimistic comment about uh, what was mentioned here several times, which is quantum chemistry and nuclear physics, which are in some sense similar systems, but not the same, obviously. There is a horrible, there is a very uh, uh, strong progress in the recent years in quantum chemistry. The Alan Kujik is doing this approach based on Gates and so on. There are new proposals, very interesting by Sirac and Solar, to do it more like in atomic or in uh, Rydberg atom system and things like that. I am strongly convinced that in 10 years there will be some non trivial uh, applications of quantum simulators for solving these problems in this, uh, these areas. The other thing that I wanted to mention is I mentioned already in my 10 minutes or, or in my five minutes is that the strong laser physics. Uh, has been for many years focused on atoms, molecules, and maybe atomic clusters. But recent five years, it is uh, the strong lasers and ultra short lasers are shined on solid state, on topological materials, on nanostructures, and things like that. This is the main trend of the um, uh, of the strong, uh, intense laser matter interactions. Now, many of these things can be again simulated with ultra cold atoms. I don't know if you remember that shaking like that, the atomic lattice is the same as adding linear potential that oscillates like that, which is electron in electric oscillating field. So there is a very direct way of simulating problems with strongly correlated solids in which you shine the laser with the strongly correlated atoms in which you shake the lattice. I think it's these uh, avenues are still to be developed in physics itself or in different areas of physics that they were studied until now. Thank you, Maciek. I think we've run out of time for the main part of this uh, panel and round table. We'll now open uh, the, the, the microphone to people who want to ask uh, questions. So if you, um, I think there's a way to raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question. And while people are thinking about the question, and I think I'm supposed to find out exactly uh, who, who raised their hands, um, while we're waiting for this, can the panelists, can we go back through the panelists and uh, finish with 30 seconds of where they think we will be in 10 years from now? Uh, why don't we we'll start again with the alphabetical order? So bad check, there you are. Where, where we will be in 10 years from now? <laughs> well, we will be much farther. I'm very optimistic about it. 
And uh, in particular, I understand, I think in understanding on, of uh, quantum dynamics in many body systems, because this is the main focus where really this quantum advantage can be studied. At the same time, in the theory, we will also be much, much further, in particular in application of tensor network uh, and codes and things like that. And also in machine learning, we will be much further. Hybrid things which combine the classical computation and uh, non-perfect quantum computers will uh, also, I think, be dominating the market. Thank you. Misha. So I um, expect that this, you know, that this uh, era of, uh, of quantum discovery, you know, will actually start to pay off, you know, and in a sense that we will be able to really advance some, you know, scientific frontier, you know, you know, to what Machik said, like understand really, you know, how, you know, systems can live in this vast Hilbert space and, you know, which classes of states can be, you know, more stable and, you know, how to manipulate those which will help us to build bigger quantum computers and more reliable quantum computers. But I also think that this age of quantum discovery will result in new applications. There will be, you know, applications for which, you know, useful applications for which quantum machines outperform the best classical machines, you know, and those, you know, will be deployed. Thank you, Misha. John, where will we be in 10 years? So um, Google has stated uh, publicly that they plan to build a 1 million qubit error-corrected quantum computer in about 10 years or so. Uh, you know, a lot of things have to be done, but they'll certainly be building substantially large systems by then. And uh, it, it'll just be a very interesting time to see how to use them. And if you can do error correction, uh, what kind of new algorithms you can, you can run. I, I'm sorry, I have to go to another meeting now. So I'll have to sign off. Thank so you. So thank you very much. I can see the sun is coming up on your side of the world. Yeah. Another <laughs> thank, meeting. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, John. Chris. Where will we uh, be boy, in 10 years? Uh, I'll, I'll be 10 seconds. I mean, ditto what was all said. I would say one, one interesting thing. I do think that science will be, will be much better off in 10 years if there is some, uh, some economic gain from this stuff. I think, I think industry building systems, we're going to benefit from it. So uh, I sincerely hope there's something out there in commerce <laughs> that's using these things. It could be machine learning. You know, it could be something. It could be a heuristic for for optimization, but if that doesn't happen, you know, science will we'll always be great in science, but you know, it's an expensive field. Uh, it won't last forever without that type of pay dirt. Sorry, it was more than 10 seconds. <laughs> That's okay. 